All right, guys. I'm Big Mike, and like always, I'd like to thank you for joining today. Today we have another Ask Me Anything session with Futures Trader 71. The AMAs are designed to be quick and casual. There's no prepared presentation. We're going to limit the session to 30 minutes. And uh, the recording will be posted on BMT after the AMA is over. Go ahead and start typing your questions now, and uh, we'll get everybody's questions answered if we have time. And turn things over to FT. Hey, Mike, can you hear me? We can hear you. Excellent. All right. Let me turn on my screen. Get this ball rolling. Not that you need to see my screen. First, I'd like to say uh, trading futures, options on futures, and spot effects involves substantial risk of loss and is not suitable for all investors. Past performance is not indicative of future results. All right. What questions do we have, Mike? Let's take a look. Um, okay, Jeff says, can you go over how you arrive at weekly projected ranges? It seems that you use the open to, to low high for one data set and use 34 points of normal range for another. Can you explain how you use this and how you arrive at these numbers? Okay. Um, it's, it's probably a lengthy subject for today, but let me show you what I'm doing. I'm assuming you can see my screen, right? Yeah, we got it. Let's see. Nope, that's not the chart. Oh, it's this one. All right. So... I've done studies that I can share with you here. I've got tons and tons and tons of studies based on market information. So this is one right here. All I've done here is looked at the, op the opening price um, on a weekly, the high and the low. And I'm computing the open to the high and open to the low. The difference between those uh, is the range, basically. The range is high to low. And I've plotted and figured out what is the most common uh, and what is considered normal range, which is uh, one sigma or 68% of the data set. What is the most common range from the open to the high over the last, whatever, since 2005? Okay, long, long, uh, long period, 422 weeks. That's a pretty good sample size. Um, and then I figure out what is the um, what is the mode or the point of control. I figure out what the extent is of this data set to get to uh, one standard deviation. I do the same for I do this to the high, and I do this to the low, open to low, open to high. Okay, and so when the week starts, I throw on the weekly open, and then I put on the open to high and open to low stats based on this spreadsheet. I look at the most common and I look at the uh, extent that it can go to. So the most common is open to six points above on the weekly, but the, 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 it could be anywhere from one point to 24 point. That is considered normal. That represents approximately 70% of the time uh, the markets within that range. So I project these uh, open to high, open to low, and I throw them on this chart. So that's where you get 1810 above, which actually, if you look at the 1810, let me shrink this a bit. On the weekly, um, it it pretty much gives us a pretty good area because this uh, uh, upper channel is uh, is 1805 or so, and an 18 below it's 18 uh, 1781. That is the narrowest range. If it breaches it, then what I do is go to the extreme range. I throw on 24 on the top, 29 on the bottom. In addition to this, I do a, a separate study on just the weekly range. Like what is the plain old weekly range? Uh, and I have a spreadsheet for that. And that is just simply um, a spreadsheet here that tests what is the most common weekly range in the S&P. Again, 
this is this is a shorter range study to 2009, 201 weeks studied, uh, and the most common weekly range is between 20 and 48, with uh, or the range of the, the the most likely or the most normal is 20 points to 48. The most likely is 34. So once I once I see once I put the open to high and open to low, I double check to see how many points that is, and if it's within that range, I keep it up. As soon as it's breached, I expand it to by either 34 points wide or uh, those other levels that I gave you from the open to the high and open to the low. Is this gospel? Is this uh, the holy grail? Is it something where I'll sell it as soon as it gets there? Absolutely not. These are uh, what I would call gross yardsticks. They're just big, uh, big pieces that I put on there that that count as a measuring stick, just like um, a construction guy will use his feet to determine how many yards you know a distance is. It's not accurate, but it just gives you a general idea of where where we would be for the week. And then essentially, what I do is use this research chart to zoom in. This is a 60-minute chart. I use it to zoom into those zones. Like, what do I have between 1810 and 1781? One of the key areas is right here, actually, at 1781. The second key area is between 1773 and uh, 1770 and a half, which 1770 and a half was the yearly high before this chop zone that we were in for most of October and the beginning of, of November. So I expect this area to get retested if we continue to sell lower, except I see a very weak high up top. This is not the kind of high we put in uh, usually when the market's exhausted and prices have reached an extre extreme. This is not a blow off top of any kind. So I think we're likely to come back and take out the 1800. I can't imagine we'd move to 1800 and just walk away from it with a one tick, one tick test. I, that, that, that's, that's too clean for me. Um, but that's basically the process. Okay, Rex is asking, he says, many times we'll gap up and you'll say your primary hypothesis is responsive selling. However, you often say that you're expecting a push up after the open before expecting responsive selling. Can you elaborate on what is driving that expectation for a further push up? Okay, so one of the things I have to look at uh, as part of the uh, morning homework, and, and I'm, I'm doing my homework online. Uh, I'm doing it offline, but I'm sharing uh, sharing the process online in what I call Trader Bytes, which I post every morning on YouTube. You just need to look for my name on YouTube, and you'll see a whole page of them. Uh, and one of the things I look at is what has it done overnight, and what is the inventory overnight? What is most likely to be uh, what is most likely to be off? Uh, overnight, who's going to be offsides overnight? Who's most likely to be? Uh, for example, yesterday uh, we came in and opened uh, right right in here above. This is the overnight session right here. The 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 profile with the blue this this box here is the overnight session. This is the day session. This is what we did yesterday. Chop 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 chop. Plosser comes out. Market gets dinged a little bit. ICANN comes out and says there's significant risk to owning stocks. Boom, the Nasdaq leads us down. Um, so that's that's yesterday. The night before, if you look at the inventory here, it's sideways. The inventory is flat, and then it starts to get long. The inventory starts to get long. You see it here in the delta. Let me expand this pane here. You can see the delta. That there's there are more people lifting the the bid, the offer, than hitting the bid therefore getting pretty long into, into the open. This bar here is the open, this red bar. So the inventory is quite a bit uh, on the long side. The expectation when that happens is that if you got long anywhere in here or if you were long into the close the day before and you come in and you see that it's uh, gapped up, your inclination is to be risk averse and to take some profits and that's going to cause responsive selling. Responsive meaning the, the market's moving towards the, the latest uh, or the last value that has been put in, which was below, which was down here that night. Um, and, and so we expect responsive selling. However, if the market just chops around 
moves up and chops around and this stays kind of flat, then uh, the overnight inventory, yeah, it's above the prior day. Uh, so technically, according to Stadelmeyer, the guy who invented market profile and Dalton who teaches it, you know, the inventory is uh, long because price is above. I don't agree with that. If price is above, yet delta is, is sitting here, the volume delta is flat, uh, it's pretty much that energy is dissipated. I expect it to try higher before rotating back. In either case, I expect it to retest the top of the prior day's range. There's a much higher probability it would retest the, higher, uh, the prior day's range than for it to open, uh, chop around, and keep going. The only circumstance under which it opens and just takes off is what's called an open drive. And those are the days you know, if the market opens and just runs away from the prior day's price range, those are the days where you have to staple your buying hand or selling hand, if it's upwards, to the table or to the chair and not trade if you tend to fade trades. Because if you have a buyer right from the get-go, that's what's considered um, the third force or the other time frame player or the bigger player, bigger participant. You don't want to fade that guy. Uh, in most circumstances, that's someone who's going to continue to buy and continue to buy and continue to buy and continue to buy. But if it opens up choppy uh, and it's just sitting sideways, chances are with a gap, I'll go back to the day session so you can see the gaps. Like here, yesterday's high is 96, uh, or the, uh, the, the Friday high is 96. Yesterday it opens, it gaps up. It's likely to, to test the top of the range or push into the range to significant areas. You can see yesterday it pushed to the what's what's called the LVN or the low volume node, and boom, buyer comes in, could not get into the next distribution. Buyer comes in, tries to push higher, could not make it. And now there's an incentive to buy, there's an incentive to sell. You have the 1800 behind you, and you have a rejection of yesterday's range, so what do you get? Boom, 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 chop. Uh, until something causes the market to revalue the product and then it's sold off. So that's, that's the process. It's not uh, necessary that there's going to be responsive selling on a gap up immediately or responsive buying on a gap down immediately. It just depends, you know, there, that's a factor, but the additional factor is what is the, what has it done as far as volume? Who was the most aggressive player? on that gap. Did, did they flatten out? And that's what the volume delta tells you down here. It shows you how many uh, lifted at the offer minus how many hit at the bid to give you the net position for the aggressive uh, traders that participated in that session. Okay. Chris is asking, do you primarily take trades with expectation of moving back into value? No. Because there are two conditions to the market. One, uh, the, the, uh, the market can be in balance, so it's choppy, like today is sort of a balancing market. Uh, we opened in range, here's the opening price, it says right here 1788 and a quarter, right inside of yesterday's range, outside of its value, right below its value. Uh, this, so my Trader bite this morning, you can go check it and compare it to what's happened so far. Uh, my expectation is for a chop. I expect the low to be tested at some point, which it did early. But I expect chop and I expect it to trade through this thin zone. And my target this morning was 92.50 and it got to it uh, fairly early on. So this is a balance condition. In this condition, I am trading towards uh, balance or towards uh, value. But the other condition that the market can be in is a trending condition, which is what's called imbalance. It's, and it has certain characteristics in that it opens, it, do, it only tests one side, it does not push both ways, whereas the, today's open pushed both ways. So if we look at today's open, see this at open, test up, test down, test up, break, comes right back into the opening swing, which are these blue lines, which is the it delineates the first up and down. It shows you where sellers started participating and where buyers started participating from the get-go. As soon as it gets back in here, I expect it to cross. Testing 92.50 right here, got to 92.75, chop, 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 push higher, and now we're in this 
again, balancing uh, mode. So today, I'm looking for trades that are likely to uh, break higher, but then be met with uh, selling. I expect trades to break lower, then be met with buying, and but constantly kind of moving back towards the middle um, until this is kind of fat and has the energy to just push in one direction. The, the thing that's elusive with this method uh, that you have to kind of hone in on, and is always a guess, as all methods are, are guessing methods because we're playing probabilities, is what condition is the market in? Is it in a balancing condition or is it in a trending condition? Uh, and, and the market moves from one to the other. It's kind of like driving. You can't say, oh, I always drive in fourth gear. Well, no, off of a red light, uh, trying to drive in fourth gear will cause your engine to stall. But when do you transition from first to second to third to fourth gear? That's when you're trying. That's when I generally take my losses, uh, because the market's in a transitioning phase, and I need to kind of experience that loss to to tell me, okay, watch out, something might be changing here. Um, but other than that, it just depends. I'm not very good with trending days. I don't like trending days. Uh, they happen. They don't happen as often. Uh, luckily, except for this year, there are a ton of them. Um, but uh, generally, I like balanced trades because I get very, very defined risk, um, and I get very, very defined targets because they're moving towards areas that are clear on the profile. Okay. Rex is asking if you can explain the concept of overnight inventory and the significance of it. The significance of it. Okay. Um, I, I think I covered that a little bit. You're just trying to see. I remember overnight inventory, the market overnight does not trade because of, you know, in this example, um, we're trading, we're looking at the ES, which is the S&P mini um, 500, and it's a, it's a market cap based product uh, that is built on 500 stocks. Um, and then if you're trading the Russell, it's a, it's a small cap based product built on 2,000 stocks or the Dow. Uh, it's, a, it's a price weighted, not market cap weighted, but price weighted index that's built on 30 stocks. You have to know what you're trading. You have to understand the product that you're trading. Just like a stock trader um, looking to, to get into a stock needs to understand the fundamentals of that stock and futures. You've got to understand what is the product you're trading, what makes it tick, what, what is it built on. Overnight, those 500 stocks are not trading like they do during the day. There are no ARB machines. There are, you know, so in, essentially what's happening is with this product, it is trading overnight in sympathy with something else. It's trading in sympathy with the Nikkei, with the Hang Seng, with uh, later in the evening with the FTSE, the Euro stocks, the DAX the CAC 40, whatever, until the book opens here uh, in the US, in New York with the stocks, it's essentially floating along. So what we want to see overnight is what is happening, how, how are the people who participated in the overnight session, which is right here, how are they positioned? So essentially, uh, yesterday, the overnight last night, price was in the the prior day's range, but uh, volume was really staying on the positive side. You can see it did not cr cross the zero line, but could not hold it. So there, it's no wonder that you get this big move down uh, that that balances this. It balances the volume that was very positive. Um, this volume here that's very positive that occurred here. It's not built on any. Uh, any any hedge in a stock or offset by a stock basket or anything. It's just inventory that's just too long. It's overnight inventory that's just too long, and it tends to balance itself out. I don't talk about overnight inventory too much because you get into a lot of technical stuff and a lot of questions. But it's it's important to look at as as the market uh, moves higher and p can possibly transition into a corrective phase where we've gone so far. Uh, and everybody and their mother is screaming, sell, 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 as soon as it drops a few points. You want to see, is it legitimate or is it not? And it, again, these are all guesses, 
but the more probabilities that you stack in your favor, the better. Okay. TZ is asking if you trade with the uh, weekly, and he also wants to know about uh, your interpretation of the VWAP. Uh, I, I trade intraday. I don't hold positions overnight generally, not, not voluntarily at least. Um, if anything, I trade options longer term. Um, that's what I hold for several days or, or weeks or whatever. But uh, futures, I'm a, I'm a pure day trader. I'm not interested in, I'm more interested in sleeping than I am interested in, in holding a, a position for the long term. So uh, it, I'm an intraday trader. As far as the VWAP, VWAP is just a measure. Um, its usefulness really relates to um, uh, relates to a a uh, it's it's a milestone or a yardstick used by a lot of trade desks around the world to measure uh, the performance uh, of an entry or the performance of the uh, trade desk manager or trader putting on a position for a fund or a bank or whatever. Um, VWAP is the volume weighted average price, and it's just taking volume and price and giving you a weighted value that uh, tracks the day. Right now it's at 89 and a quarter. But the most traded price for the day is this pink line here, as you can see it on the profile. It's, that's where the fattest volume is. If I click on that, it's traded 44,113 at that price at 88, uh, looks like 88.50 and the VWAP's at 89 and a quarter. So it doesn't represent the most traded price, it just represents an average starting at the open of all the, all the prices and all the volumes that have traded at every price. In other words, volume profiling is just a more accurate uh, depiction of where the volume is. VWAP is just a kind of a, a guesstimate as to where it is, but if you're a seller, if a fund is a seller and they want to see how did you perform, today you got an order on your desk that says sell 100,000 contracts uh, in the ES as a hedge of something else. Uh, the order is going to say give me uh, sell 89 uh, or better. Okay? And then what the VWAP is used for in some of these shops is to measure how well you perform. The more you sell above the VWAP, the better. Uh, if you keep selling below VWAP, if you're selling in the hole here at 86, 85, whatever, and VWAP's way behind you, you're selling way below the, the weighted average price of the market. Another thing that people don't, don't look at often that is used more and more is the time-weighted average price, which is a TWAP, uh, but I won't get into that. It's kind of the same concept. It's just a way of measuring uh, performance. You'll find that a lot of volume a lot of times goes off right at VWAP, uh, and, and it tends to hold the market, at least temporarily, at those prices when it returns to it. Okay. Speaking of time, I'm going to combine two questions here that had to do with uh, TPO or market profile charts. Uh, do it is asking if you incorporate single prints into your trading and what time frame you use to identify them. And Arnie is also asking if you uh, don't you find a TPO chart uh, in conjunction with volume profile to be much better for defining areas of interest instead of using candlestick bars, which could produce way too much noise? Okay, so I have a volume profiling, uh, a market profile chart that I use. This happens to be the weekly because I'm monitoring the overall health of this uh, latest run up. I do look at it, but I, I trigger off a of volume because time doesn't matter to me. A, 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 a regular volume uh, uh, or a regular TPO-based chart uh, is, is breaking down the market in brackets of 30 minutes. Each one of these boxes represents 30 minutes. Why 30 minutes? Why not 5? Why not 15? Why not 60? It doesn't matter. In general, Wherever there's a single print, I have an LVN. I'm more over time, and this is since 2005, over time I've noticed that the market is much more likely to uh, test and check a, an LVN than it is a single print. These light blue lines right here, these are 
a single print. This is the beginning of a single print right here. So you see where there's a single print, where there's a single print, this, this is a volume profile, this is a TPO chart based on 30 minute brackets. Where there's a single print, there's an LVN. Where there's a single print, there's an LVN. You know, and that's, that's how it works. However, on a day like today where there wasn't a single print, there's still an LVN here. Okay, and on the other side, there's an LVN down here. Single print, LVN. Single print starts, LVN starts. Single print stops, here's the top of your LVN zone. On and on and on. I get more information, more detail out of a volume profile than I do a regular uh, market profile chart. Market profiles make things a little bit neater to look at because they're just blocks of time. Uh, but I prefer to see what's there, and the market gives us enough information to see volume, so why not use that? It's really a preference thing. They're both telling you almost the same thing, but I find that you know you could you could form a lot of TPOs at a certain price, but there could be no volume there at all. But in general, where the the market spends a lot of time, it also forms a fair amount of of volume. So they're 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 in alignment. But again, I prefer volume. Okay, AH is asking if you can share this chart definition and uh, presumably where he can get that. Uh, all of my chart definitions for uh, Linsoft or Market Delta charts are available to uh, Stage 5 clients. Uh, I make everything that I do, including homework and all that stuff, available to those people. I used to post them on my site, but if you want to go to futurestrader71.com forward slash uh, contact and shoot me a message, uh, I'll, just, I'll be happy to send you the chart definition. Otherwise, just put it in the AMA thread. Uh, and I'll respond there and give you a link to the definition, okay? Okay. Uh, we've got about three or four minutes left. Let's see what we can get to. Uh, Rex is asking, he says if it's midday and we have a P-shaped intraday profile, what kind of general expectation does this indicate? What about a B, as in boy-shaped profile? Okay, good question. Um, and And you... Most people probably need to look at webinar two on my website to kind of get get this question, but uh, I'll, I'll cover it here. Generally, uh, wherever you have, like for example, uh, this this profile here balanced all day long yesterday until it broke down, uh, and before it came back on the close and traded all this, what you had was a P-shaped profile. I'll draw it here. It was before this happened, it was a P-shaped profile that looked something like this, right? Like that. Um, and if this happens on a break lower, it has a different meaning than if we open down here and then started to trade up and then sat sideways to form that P this way. The, the, my markings don't stay on the chart because the chart's constantly refreshing. Um, those two, those two mean to, two totally uh, different things. If the market starts down here, has no volume, and then rips up to form the stem of a P, this stem here before the fat part, uh, and, then, and then starts to chop, chances are what you're forming, uh, to most people, that's going to look like a flag. What you're forming is a lot of uh, potential, a lot of energy for the, for the profile to uh, extend up to extend up and flatten out. So what it'll end up looking like is flat at the bottom, P shape, but then it'll flatten out at the top so that it's more of a curve like this, more of a normal and what's called Gaussian profile, Gaussian curve, right? Statistical curve. But in this situation here where you have uh, a lot of chop and it breaks away, the market's essentially telling you, hey, we're moving out of value. We like these prices, and now we've moved out of value. Chances are the market's not, before the session ends, the market's not going to come back in and chop around in here again. So the meaning of that P-shaped profile is uh, different than one where we start here, chop around, build energy, and it's likely to continue higher because everybody that got short as it climbed, 
And in here, remember, volume does not cre is not created unless a buyer and a seller interact with each other and trade. All the all the shorts that that were part of this move up and part of this fatness here in the profile are likely to dissipate because uh, a good uh, a majority of the volume on the exchange is day time frame volume. Um, those guys do not want to cover margin for the night and they end up they end up flattening their position which helps drive the market up so uh to you know not, it's kind of specific but uh, uh for rex's question but the 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 thing is it's it makes it makes a big difference how that profile is shaped but to get the answer it's not from a book it's not because i told you so to get the answer always think in the perspective of if you're a trader sitting in the middle of a pit where this trading happened what would you be feeling? What would you be thinking as a day trader? And you'll get the answer because that's how I get the answer. It's not from a book. It's just watching the market and, and trying to guess what my opponents are doing uh, because I'm trading against other people. Okay. Jeff uh, has a question. Do you use Fibonacci extensions to target areas that may uh, I'm not sure what he means, but to target like 161 percent, he's also listing two and 300 percent, which are not Fibonacci numbers. So, do you right. do anything like that? Yes, I do. So, so uh, in projecting the next move up from this balance zone that started on the 18th, I have a Fib extension here at 100 percent and 162 percent, and that becomes uh, the measured move number that I would tweet out. Um, and, and I do use them when I run out of, when I don't have any profiles or whatever. Like right now, I have a projected, uh, on the weekly, I think I have a projected uh, target at 1840 based on a, the swing low pullback here and then projected upwards. Uh, it projects, I think, 100, uh, 1793 and a quarter and it projects 1840, and those are FIB extensions. The only reason I use those extensions is because I don't have anything else. All I have is trend lines, patterns, and FIB extensions to predict or try to give me an idea of what to expect um, when we move away where there's, there, there are no profiles. Uh, and that's, that's how I use them. I, don't, I wouldn't call them a tier one um, tool to use. Okay. All right, I have one question of my own that you uh, you just kind of piqued my interest. You said something just a second ago that the majority of the volume are day time frame traders because they don't want to cover the uh, the margin overnight. Can you tell me, in your opinion, do you do you think this is um, how would you describe those traders? Would you talk about them? Would describe them as like retail, or are you saying that a lot of uh, shops or institutions have the same philosophy? Uh, it's it's actually uh, a lot of a, a lot of uh, locals. Uh, so so I'll tell you this. Um, this is a, a simple one. You can get the information on your own whenever you want to, which is my preference. Um, so let's look for the ES. The ES right here. So th this column is the. Oh, they took away the open interest. Oh, interest right right here. So the open interest in the ES is 282, uh, 2.8 million. Okay, the volume is 1.22 million for that prior day. Yesterday was at 1.55 million. This is the settlement data right out of the CME group. So you can see the open interest is that much. The volume is this much. Now what you do is you go to the next day. So when when tomorrow comes, look at the open interest and 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 uh, keep this. Look at the open interest for tomorrow, and you'll see how much it changed. And what you'll see is that uh, it doesn't change that much. It changes by a few hundred thousand. That's it. Yet we're trading anywhere between uh, 1.1 and 1.7 million contracts a day in this product. Okay, and most of that is just turnover and turnover and turnover. And it's not retail uh, because retail is not who's doing the, the bigger volume. It's it's the professionals, it is the tremendous number of prop shops, trade desks, ARB shops, all that stuff. And those companies mostly, uh, as, as far as I know, 
don't hold positions overnight. Why don't you want to hold those positions overnight? The main reason is it takes a lot of capital because now you have to put up, what is it now, $4,500 per contract in the ES. You have to put that up with your clearing firm uh, to, to hold a product that has uh, almost a $90,000 per contract notional value. And so it makes, it does not make economic sense for these shops to have their traders trade that tremendous amount of volume. Some of these traders will trade four, five hundred lots at a go um, to all of a sudden put up, you know, nine million dollars, twelve million dollars in cash to hold those positions overnight. They want to close them, which means they have to be closed by Right. Uh, four fifteen Chicago time, and they open them up again at five. Right, especially when they can trade in and out of them for pennies and uh, fees. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. All right. Exactly. Thanks, FT. Um, guys, if uh, you had any questions that did not get answered, you can go to FT seventy one's AMA thread on Big Mike Trading. If you don't know where that is, just go to bigmiketrading.com on the top right in the search bar. Just type in AMA space FT seventy one, and you'll find it. That's also where I will post the video here later today. Uh, guys, uh, we have one more AMA from FT. A lot of uh, <laughs> acronyms there. Uh, this year, I'm looking real quick. Let's see. It's on. Uh, it's two weeks from today on 10th of December, and that'll be it for this year. So uh, stay tuned for that one. And then um, I hope everybody has a good Thanksgiving. Uh, this is the last uh, event that we have before Thanksgiving. So guys, hope you have a good time with your, your friends and your family. And we'll see everybody next time. Thanks, FT. Thanks so much for having me on, Mike. Take care.